it's interesting because here you are when, when the role comes along and you're in your mid-40s. And um, I think the LA Times at, the, at that point said, unknown British actor, which Brent Spiner put on your dressing room door. <laughs> the actual quote was, unknown British Shakespearean actor. And uh, yes, Brent had a notice made, mm. which had at the top of it in red, bright red, warning. <laughs> <laughs> Unknown British Shakespearean actor. <laughs> like, you know, beware of the dog. <laughs> <laughs> Which, and, and, and you then found the sign for sale at an auction, I think. I did, yeah. And I proved to them that it wasn't the original <laughs> sign. Because I had it. So is that proof of destiny or is it just, oh my God, how, coincidence. How did you get this role? You happened to be in LA mm -hmm. for something. How did it come about? Thanks to... Um, a professor of English, a Shakespeare scholar at UCSB, Santa Barbara. Um, I had become involved with him and his work as a bit of a teacher. He knocked on my dressing room door one day when we were doing the Roman season at Stratford in 1972 and said, um, you don't know me, but I'm here with a group of American students and um, um, we have class every day, and I'd like to invite you to our class tomorrow to talk about tonight's performance. And I said, no, I can't do that. I don't, I don't do that. I can't talk about it. It's not, it's not what I do. No, it's not possible. And he said, actually, he did say, I've got a bottle of whiskey for you. <laughs> I'm, an, I'm not an alcoholic, by the way. But um, so I went, I mean, you know, a bottle of whiskey is not, you know, mm -hmm. but in those days on a, salary of about $50 a week, it was pretty good. And um, I found I had something to say, as you've now discovered. <laughs> um, I had something to say. Mm -hmm. And thanks to Homer D. Swander, known as Murph, and may he be comfortable because he's, he's ill and sick, mm -hmm. and in a, living in a hospice uh, in Santa Barbara. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to see him in a few days. Oh. Um, he uh, encouraged me to teach. And so when I, had, when I wasn't working in the UK, um, he would fly me over to Los Angeles and I would tour local colleges, campuses. I never came here. I don't know why I never came here. Um, all over Southern California, lecturing, doing master classes, holding workshops and so forth. And um, I got to know uh, through this work, a professor at UCLA, David Rhodes, um, who had a spare room in his house. And so whenever I came to LA, I lived in his house. Mm -hmm. And uh, one night he said to me, listen, I'm doing a, a lecture. Um, it's part of a course of public lectures uh, on campus. And I'm lecturing about the changing face of comedy in dramatic literature. He said, oh, it's going to be so tiresome. But if you and an actress friend of mine came along and read extracts illustrating my lecture, it would be so much more fun. And there's $100. I remember the $100 huh. part very well. <laughs> and I said, sure. And we went along, we did it, and we had fun. And we went out and spent the $100 afterwards. And um, the next morning, I got a call from my agent who I'd never met or even spoken to because I didn't have an agent. I mean, mm -hmm. there was an agent, but mm -hmm. he was not somebody who was mm -hmm. in my life. And he said, first of all, I want to know what the hell were you doing at UCLA last night? And why would Gene Roddenberry want to see you this morning? Wow. And uh, so I had to come clean and say, well, I was, uh, I was helping. And he said, you're not a scholar. And I said, no, I, I'm an actor. Please don't think I'm not an actor. I am an actor. Uh, signed up for the course of public lectures was a wonderful man called Robert Justman, who was one of the executive producers of the original series and had been brought out of retirement to help launch Next Generation. And I got to know Robert and his wife very well over the years. He was a dear friend. And um, his wife confirmed that at some point during the evening, he turned to her and said, we found the captain. Wow. Well, he told Gene Roddenberry that, and I was called in. I went to Gene's house the next morning. Oh. and. It took Gene a few minutes to grasp that I was not the man he wanted in his new Star Trek. And the meeting was over in under 10 minutes, wow. and I was out the door again. All I can remember, there was a lot of green shag pile carpet on the floor. Oh. I think Gene moved on to something better than green <laughs> shag pile carpet. And um, Why did he not want you? Um, 
for the very reason that the, you know Brent put that thing on the door. What, I, he apparently said something. What would I want with a, bro a bald British Shakespearean actor in this show? It makes no sense. Mm. Forget him. Uh, somewhere in the archives at Paramount Pictures, there must be a memo which was written by Gene and sent to all the different departments saying, I do not want to hear that <laughs> actor's name wow. again. Because wow. people kept saying, what about seeing Patrick mm. Stewart again? And, and but you, I, you were hesitant about taking the part. Pardon? You were hesitant about taking the part. Oh, so hesitant. Mm. Well, but although I treated it as a bit of a joke. I didn't know what Star Trek was. My ch children informed me what Star Trek was. And then they were all kind of jaffs, laughs about beating mm. me up, Scotty, and all that kind of, which I didn't understand. But they told me what it was about because they'd watched it as children. And uh, I went back for a couple of more. It, it, it took about six months, the whole process. But I just opened in a wonderful production of Who's Afraid of Virginia mm -hmm. Woolf at the Young Vic Theatre in mm -hmm. London. And I was loving that experience. Mm -hmm. And there was talk about transferring. In fact, we were already in negotiations. Billy Whitelaw was playing, oh, wow. uh, was playing Martha. Transferring you were to George. the West End. I was George. Mm. I'd never been in the West End in a commercial production huh. before. When suddenly I got a call, you've got to come back to LA. The production had just ended. This is the last audition. It's down to you and another actor. I have never been able to discover who the other actor was. Wow. Nobody would ever tell me. They oh. knew, but they wouldn't tell me who yeah. it was. I have an idea who it might have been. And um, I went back. I did my audition for the studio. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, I wore a toupee, a hairpiece, which they knew I had, and they wanted me to wear it. And then when I was taking it off in the joining room, the producers, the Hollywood people, the Paramount people all came in to say thank you very much. And my, the hairdresser said to me after, you know why they came in, don't you? They didn't want to say thank you. They wanted to see what you look like without a hairpiece. Oh, wow. And um, I left this... Audition was at 8 o'clock in the morning, a bit early for me to be auditioning. And I left the studio, and there was a coffee shop down Melrose Avenue that I was very fond of um, from you know, my, my days just mm. drifting around L.A. And I went to a shop and bought the English Sunday newspapers and took it to the coffee shop. It was before cell phones. And uh, I was, oh, I sat there for oh, more than three hours reading the papers, drinking coffee, having a good breakfast, while my agent, who had been called by the studio, I think before I was actually off the lot saying, it's Patrick, we wow. want him, was trying to find me. Wow. And had no idea oh where I was. Oh, my God. And uh, uh, I was just happily yeah. reading it because I have mm -hmm. a policy about auditioning. When the audition is over, forget it. Erase that it ever happened. Otherwise, you will drive yourself mm -hmm. crazy. Just forget it. If mm. something good comes of it, that's lovely. If it doesn't, it doesn't matter. You just move on to the next one. And um, also, you've got to remember about auditioning, too, that, and I didn't know this until I was myself a director and sat and auditioned actors. When you're waiting to go into the room where the producer or the director or whoever is, don't be afraid. Don't be nervous. Don't feel intimidated or scared. Just know that the people in that room want you to be the best thing that they have ever seen yeah. in their lives. They want you to be it. Mm -hmm. You have more enthusiasm going for you and hopefulness that you will give them exactly what they're looking mm -hmm. for, that, that, um, that they will want to work with you and cast you. Um, because that's, I mean, there are some you know, types that don't think like mm -hmm. that. But for the most part, people who are holding auditions, and it's an exhausting procedure, mm -hmm want everybody to be wonderful. They're not sitting there being dismissive of you or anything. So mm. it's a good thing to get you through the experience.